<laughs> what is up, Dan? And sideways, you lovely individuals. We have returned. It's League Unlock. Eric and Mark with you, beauties. If you didn't watch the last episode, you might have been surprised that what? LCS matches on a Thursday before the weekend. They got, you know, we're second fiddle when it comes uh, to scheduling for Riot. But yes, some bonus games to kick off the week. And you may have seen Bronny James get drafted alongside LeBron. But the OG father-son duo in the LCS that we got to witness was Daddy Impact and his little buddy Sniper on the day because they exchanged solo kills, had some fun in spring, but Impact really felt like he wanted to make a statement in this series against the rookie. Usually it's such a kind and caring League of Legends father Impact is, he drops his duties and responsibilities. He forgets to tell his son, General Sniper on 100 Thieves, that you know what? You got an LCS match today, buddy. You got to be prepared. He certainly didn't look prepared, and neither did a lot of the rest of the 100 Thieves team, maybe except for uh, a couple moments from Quid and from River you could look towards. Other than that, not really the best showing today from 100 Thieves. I mean, honestly, it's insane that this first game was 40 minutes, and there were slight angles where maybe it looked like 100 Thieves was going to get back into it, but then... Impact shows up to the fight, and whoever he was ulting, they were dying, and countless times he's just running in against four people. This was the ultimate juggernaut raid boss Mordekaiser in game one. It's the classic. This is one of those ones that has been crafted, has been brewed over time, and Impact's career getting to bust out the Mordekaiser just like this. We've seen it a couple of other times in the last year or two, every time it kind of creeped back into that meta option in the top side as one of these counter picks to stuff that is coming through. And absolutely against Sniper taken to school is the way that it had to be looked at here from Mr. Impact in the top side. And as you said, you got to some of these team fights later on, which kudos to 100 Thieves for even getting to a later on in this first game. That is where River, that is where Quid were finding those moments, finding the little team fights they could until the Mordekaiser started arriving and started making it not necessarily a team fight that you could handle because, well, you're missing a team member and the Mordekaiser is about to get big as strong coming out of there. And unfortunately, it didn't get any better in game two for Sniper. This Renekton's getting caught out top lane. He's getting caught out in the river. He's getting caught out in bot lane. Yes, there was an emphasis from Team Liquid to find him around the map and catch him out, but definitely some egregious positioning from him throughout this set. The bot lane, Jan and Core JJ absolutely gapped Meech and Ayla in this one, despite a Seraphine pick trying to have something spicy. They completely destroyed it. We even get the rare Zig sighting now out of APA in that second game. And yeah, he can still play his one trick. Very much a, a very strong, very explosive reminder that the Ziggs is absolutely the champion that he is known for. And he shows it here in this game. It's a tough one for 100 Thieves when you look at the second game in this series. Obviously, another SmackDown or an even rougher SmackDown, I think, from the hands of Team Liquid, where you kind of look at game one. Obviously, you've got snipers struggling and some mistakes. So you have some positives, but it is that Team Liquid force that comes through. Game two, it is all Team Liquid at that point, and that was where I think the disappointment is. And some really questionable choices on top of the poor gameplay on the Renekton coming across from General Sniper. And probably the worst champion to do it on, on a Renekton. Something so simple and something that just looks so pathetic when it is caught out, when it is played in that type of manner that is out of sync of everybody else and just getting blown up and turned into a, a leather handbag by the rest of the squad. At least, Skarner, you have that ulti to fall back on, even if you're 0-4, 0-7. And there's no hiding a Renekton. You are completely useless. He was pretty useless in this one. And a bit of a wake-up call for 100 Thieves that, yeah, you're a couple tiers below these true contenders and defending champs uh, like Team Liquid. They still look like a playoff team, but now at that bottom half, more than fighting for the top. But at 1-2 and two now, despite NRG picking up their first series... Uh, win of the season. I still feel better about 100 Thieves at 1-2 and two after they get smashed and NRG gets a win against Immortals. Yes, and, and we'll talk about Immortals and NRG in just a second, but obviously when you look at that comparison of 100 Thieves and NRG, you do carry in a bit of last split as well, and that sure. gives you that feeling that sure, progress, progression type of being 
at that next level and improving. 100 Thieves has shown us that in that spring split. Now you have to do it in this summer split where you are challenged. You have top dogs like Cloud9 getting these opportunities with the best of three and Team Liquid showing that confidence, showing that evolution from MSI. That's going to be the big challenge for these 100 Thieves. No longer do you have this hot start and you get to hold out as that front runner through this split. You're going to have to climb up. You're going to have to charge and challenge for your spot within this playoff ranking because let's be real. This should be a playoff squad in 100 Thieves. Yes, anything but a playoff squad level of play from General Sniper today. But yes, we are looking at this 100 Thieves team as a whole as being in that six, you know, six to uh, three type of zone. Where in that zone you're going to fall is obviously extremely important towards these uh, rankings and where you're going to be for the playoff situation. And luckily for them, they do have these bottom three teams in the LCS that maybe Shopify is just even worse than we thought because IMT in their two series now since then have not looked so good. NRG gets the 2-0. It's anything but clean. You had like a 21 minute first blood in this one and there were I think five kills at the 30 minute mark in this second game and this isn't some genius LCK. Everyone's playing perfectly. There's no picks to be had. It felt like both teams were just a little scared or hesitant to be making any plays. It's just a tough situation with Immortals that I think everybody got caught out kind of like you do once a year every time when it's in the spring and you're starting to see the sun shining out. You're feeling it on. Oh, man, it's nice and warm. It's a good time. It's going to be fantastic spring. And then you remember, oh, yeah, there's a lot of rain that comes around in spring and it's got to happen like that. And that's kind of the feeling with Immortals right now. You had that sunshine to start the year and kind of people going, OK. There are some pieces on this roster. There is some potential with these young players. You're adding in an arrow and what he did with Golden Guardians before. This absolutely can be a ticket to success. We want that early pass. You're learning there's going to be some rain. There's going to be some bumpy roads on the way to this path to success. That's what it looked like from Immortals, and that's here it is for NRG as well, picking it up together. That has to be mentioned. I think nothing insanely impressive this doesn't necessarily scream the NRG that beat G2 just last year at Worlds but this is an NRG that was at least good enough on the day to carve themselves a victory in the series and claim a spot ahead in in the LCS stand and highlight slash most hilarious moment from this series for me I love Azale and him tr transitioning into play-by-play -play stuff he's actually done fantastic but how are you going to compare Game 2 between NRG and IMT saying Palafox finds FBI in the same spot Faker finds Ruler? It is week three of the LCS regular season, NRG versus IMT. We can't put those two plays in the same breath. I love it. I'm here for it, my man. Azale's, Azale's our boy, our Canadian man out there on the broadcast. I always got our, our, our respect for him. And, and yes, he has been doing a great job. One of the great things with that LCS broadcast, having these type of changes, having these new positions for some of these people getting to try it out. It was work. It was, it was working. I was feeling the vibes. And then, yeah, he absolutely said that. And you kind of take it out a bit going, uh, buddy, we're, we're, we're in the LCS arena still. I don't know if it's... We're, we're not even at a live event. We're not even at a live event. Like, we can't do this, man. Uh, but hey, Pal Fox, he does have a good play. He does... Uh you know catch up it's not fbi obviously it's tactile fbi on nrg but it, it's no faker ruler level but it yeah. is a nice play i'll give it that they avoid disaster going zero and three but nrg still a lot of question marks around the squad and obviously around immortals as well there are no question marks about whether gen g and jdg are good squads as they both march on to the six and zero start to summer and this entire split really just feels like it's going to be an A to Z speed run of Kanavi and Canyon farming teams on AP junglers. Someone's got to crack the code. Someone needs to get through the secret uh, of this regime and find out exactly what is the sauce to cripple this squad and take them down. Because I tell you what, I've got zero, zero answers on how this is going to happen right now. It's almost unfair to have JDG kind of lumped into this conversation because JDG has been good. They've been great. 
but to the level of excellency and per perfectness that we have seen from Gen G, I don't think it's comparable. And when you look at this series against DRX today from Gen G and what was available, what options, how they were able to push through and power into this victory spot, it is almost unfair because what do you do? What exactly do you do in pick and ban setting out right from that start of this match? When you realize across from you, okay, we got to take in consideration the meta, just like you do in any other type of situation, any other team. And then you go, wait, we got Canyon playing whatever he wants. So, well, there's a whole other layer to the meta that we got to go through. Well, and then they've got someone like Chovy who can just absolutely masterclass you in lane and take those advantages elsewhere. You've got an Ezreal that's giga buffed up in that bottom lane and having a duo of pays with Lehens, you know, force feeding him these kills. That's not a good option. And then what else? Oh, that's right. You've got Giga Broken top lane tank still in Cassante and Skarner providing plenty of flexibility and comfort for someone like Keen. And with Keen playing arguably the best he's ever played in his career. Yes, he's reached, I think, some type of, you know, level towards this before, but never, I think, the consistency of this type of level and confidence that he is now carrying as a domestic champion and the way that he feels the form of this Gen G team is, I don't know how you stop this train, man. I think the biggest change with Keen is on teams past, you would see him get caught out, go for plays, die, being over aggressive because he's on a team where he probably felt like if I don't carry on this pick or on this champion, we're going to lose the game. So I've got to go above and beyond and make these kind of psycho plays. Now he says, oh my gosh, guys, I got solo killed. I'm so sorry. We're going to... Oh. You're smashing everywhere on the map. The pressure isn't there for him to have to 1v9 because all five players on this team are insane. I want to take a moment with that, with Keen, and the conversation about that, and as well with someone like Canyon finding success for Gen G. You look at last year, not an impressive year from Canyon. People were saying he's washed now. That's one of those ones where I want to remind people and, you know, remind ourselves at times too to keep track of and in these type of situations and understand it because I can see a similar one right now. A player like Tarzan over in the LPL, someone that we know has incredible talent like Canyon that you talk about with these things, but then you see that it's way more than just the individual impact. It is a team impact, team environment type of thing. And you have to be able to sift through all of that. And sometimes you miss that diamond gets through your your machine and ah there you there you go there goes your payday someone missed out letting canyon slip through the cracks and get his hands into the gen g organization and the pa mastermind power they now have yeah and i think it really will make people appreciate and understand that sometimes just a chain of a change of scenery a fresh organization a fresh new squad complete change and you can completely revitalize a career which yeah canyon looks pretty much right back uh, to that mvp level and is a front runner for mvp six and zero 12 and 0 overall it's it's also almost a given already that somebody from gen g is going to be picking up MVP. They continue to look absolutely unstoppable in the LCK and apparently internationally as well. But that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you beautiful people. As always, thank you so much for hanging out and we will catch you on the next one.